and her background is Latvian and Scottish. That's quite a combination. Her parental background is quite mixed. She's been married more than once. And both of her marriages took place in and around Ottawa. She, before her current activity, she was a telecommunications consultant, which is kind of interesting. And she's right in the middle now of school board drama. With the strikes on the horizon and the discomfort among some teachers' groups. And tonight she's agreed she will tell all. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I would introduce Lynn Scott and ask her to come up and speak to us tonight about her experiences as a school trustee. sort of write out a whole speech for you. But then when I realized it was going to be a small group, I said, let's not do that. Let's try to talk about things that matter in a more casual way because I wouldn't mind picking your brains on a few things too. So be warned. I also have to confess to you that this is actually not the first time I've spoken to a Rotary Club. Uh, although I've never spoken to one in Ottawa before. The last time I spoke to a Rotary Club was in 1963, when I was invited to come to the Gibbons Porcupine Rotary Club to tell them about my experience with the Adventures in Citizenship program because in 1963, I made my first visit to Ottawa as a Rotary-sponsored adventurer. Oh, wow. And it was truly an amazing experience, which even today is vividly fresh in my mind. It continues. It does, I know. And you do the Adventures in Technology, which, yes. is, which is a sort of a parallel companion program to that. But that trip, was a revelation to me in a lot of different ways. Uh, for one thing, I had never expected to be able to do something like that. In the town, as I was growing up, the social structure was very, very rigid, rigidly stratified. And as a relatively poor kid with no family connections who lived in the unfashionable part of town whose dad was a blue collar worker, uh, people like me just didn't get chosen for things like that. And so it was a great surprise to me when my school high school principal called me into his office and told me that I had been the one selected to go and that the Rotary was going to look after everything for me, even down to a compartment, a private compartment on the train because it was an overnight journey. And I had never traveled on a train overnight. Every journey from Timmins was an overnight journey. <laughs> but I'd never traveled on the train overnight in any other fashion than sitting up in the regular coach <laughs> and trying to sleep sitting up. So, so that was an adventure in itself. And we pulled into the station downtown here in Ottawa. And my hosts met me. They were the Tilly family who used to have, back in those days, a piano store right on the Spark Street Mall, which made me feel very happy because music was one of my things. Uh, they were wonderful hosts and took us all over the place. The other girl who was staying with them and myself, they toured us around by car through around along the river, the Ottawa and the Rideau and the canal and everything else, and uh, took us to the hunt to hunt clubs, the hunt club for refreshments. Uh, they 
drove down to Manatee. We're friends of theirs who had connections with the group of seven artists, had a wonderful private collection of paintings, and we got to see some paintings that were not on public, public display uh, firsthand. Uh, our sessions that were organized for the 100 odd students from all across the country who were attending this were held mostly at Carleton University in buildings where the paint was barely dry. It was just at the beginning of the big expansion as they got ready to accommodate students who belonged to baby boom years. And uh, we had seminars and discussion groups and mock parliament and all kinds of things. We were disappointed a little bit though. Uh, Madame Vanier, when we visited Rideau Hall for a reception, apologized that her husband, the Governor General, was unable to, to, to be with us. And we also lost out on one of our other speakers, uh, assuming Mr. Lester B. Pearson, who at the time uh, was rather busy getting ready to open a new minority apartment. <laughs> Uh, and we had to make do with Paul Martin seeing him instead. But he, he was quite, quite, quite adequate. But the picnic in the Gatineau Park, I'd never seen, I had never seen trilliums before because up north, it's too far north for them to grow. And the friendships that I made with other students, some of us corresponded after that for years. But the friendships I made with other students, the discussions that I had with so many of them, truly an amazing experience. And one where I think all of us, even though we had no great revelations, no huge earth shattering ideas during the adventure, I think every one of us left with a sense that yes, there were things we could and should be considering doing to make our communities better, to make our country better, to make our world better and a faith that yes, we were in fact able to do that, would be able to succeed at doing that in whatever way we could. And so that was one of the things, I think, that helped to lead me as my son got involved in school uh, here in Ottawa, that, that began to lead me to consider that maybe there were some things that I could do to make the education system just a little bit better. When James started school, we, start, uh, we were living in Southeast Ottawa, and everything seemed to be fine. I mean, they had kindergarten for Pete's sakes. When I was a child, they didn't have kindergarten. Well, actually, that's not true. There was one kindergarten in the school that served the fashionable part of town, but the other schools didn't have kindergarten. Uh, but they had kindergarten, and they even had it for four-year-olds. And they, they would bus your child to the school on a school bus. This was luxury unimagined by me. And I thought, oh, this is, this is just super. But then, not that long after he started school, the Ottawa Board of Education said, we're going to do a, a, an accommodation review. We might consider closing a school and changing a bunch of school boundaries. Well, there's nothing more guaranteed to get parents involved than an accommodation. <laughs> and to our great horror in my school, we discovered that we didn't actually have an active parent school association. So the first chore was to try to get enough parents together that we could nominate somebody to represent us in this study to make sure that our views wouldn't be missed out. And then after that, we discovered that we might as well, because we heard from other schools, that their parent school associations were doing all kinds of things to help to improve conditions in the school. Uh, so we thought we might as well try some of that. We could do some fundraising, we could buy some library books, we could do a lot of things. And in the course of that, I uh, was having a quiet conversation with one of the Ottawa Board trustees uh, the late Marjorie Lawry, who at one time was chair of the Ottawa Board, and she said to me, she said, you know, Lynn, if you want to know more about what you can do, you could go to our Community Liaison Advisory Committee. And I thought, okay, I'll try that. I'll go and see what's going on. And when I went, 
I sat in the audience and listened, and they were talking about a whole lot of things that I just didn't know anything about at all. They were talking about special education. Apparently there was new legislation about special education, and they were trying to figure out how to make it work in the Ottawa schools. And they were talking about other curriculum changes, and they were talking about a whole bunch of things. And I was, these, these things are going to have an impact on my son. These things are going to have an impact on my school. So I went more regularly, and then I discovered that there was another group called Council of Elementary School Parents. And they had the opportunity to nominate an actual member of the Community Liaison Advisory Committee. And when I went to one of their meetings, I ended up becoming the new representative for the <laughs> Council of Elementary School Parents on, on the uh, Community Liaison Advisory Committee. And I have to tell you, I learned a lesson from that, which probably none of you have ever really mastered where you wouldn't be here. And that is that duct tape is really useful stuff. You need two pieces. You need one piece that you put over your mouth so you can't say anything that other people will think is intelligent. And the other piece you put very tightly around your arms so that when they call for volunteers, you can't put your hand up. So obviously none of you mastered that lesson any better than I had mastered that lesson. And uh, so I ended up uh, sitting on the Community Liaison Advisory Committee of the Ottawa Board. And in the course of doing that, what I gradually came to understand was that there was a lot more to public education than my son's school, my son and his class. There, there were a whole bunch of other things that were going on, and some of the ways that decisions were made were extremely mysterious. Uh, I served on a study committee, uh, which included several trustee members. I remember uh, Jane Dobell was one of the trustees who sat on, on this committee. That was looking, originally, we were supposed to be looking at overloading the elementary curriculum because the trustees had been hearing complaints that the elementary curriculum was overloaded because the board kept asking for 20 minutes of daily phys ed and 20 minutes of computer time and 20 minutes of something else. And so when, when they put all that together, it seemed more than a little unwieldy and there were certainly parent complaints and teacher complaints. Although parents actually also wanted their kids to have the computer, the library, the the, the phys ed, the arts, the fine arts time and everything else. The challenge was how do you make it all work when you have a, a school day that is fixed in length? And so we, stu we started to study the question. And what we eventually decided was that there wasn't a problem with overloading the elementary curriculum at all. But there were a lot of problems with how it was organized in terms of how you got information out to the schools and then how the schools made it work when you had schools of a lot of different sizes. Every class had a different bunch of kids with different needs in it. Uh, I had a chance through that study to visit more than half of the elementary schools of the Ottawa Board. And I found it really interesting to see the huge differences between the schools because there were the schools that clearly had tons of support there from their local communities and there were also the schools where you could see that they were serving a very disadvantaged group of children and parents and then when i started to take that information and put it beside some of the other information that i, I had access around you know, how many children were being held back a year because they weren't doing well enough in school and so on. You started to see patterns that you could see that the poor kids, particularly the kids who didn't speak English, uh, the kids who came from any kind of problematic background, uh, who needed the support, were not doing as well. And yet, in the schools, you didn't see the evidence that they were actually getting 
any additional support to compensate for the fact that they were arriving at school at a disadvantage. And so I was thinking about even running for the school board in Ottawa when my husband and I decided that we would build a house. And we built a house in West Carlton. So resigned from all the committees, planned a different life, moved to West Carlton, uh, and uh, enrolled James in a new school. And so I was so used to being so involved in Ottawa, uh, practically the first thing I did was make an appointment with the principal of this new school to go and we were talking about all the wonderful things I'd been doing and how interesting this was and that was and the other thing was. And finally the principal, uh, Wendell Stiles by name, leaned back in his chair and he said to me, you know, Mrs. Scott, sometimes out here in Tobolton, we're just as glad to be this far away from 133 Green Bank Road where the board headquarters are. And I thought to myself, okay, this is an interesting idea. Uh, and I discovered that the school that my son was attending now was actually doing a remarkably good job. And yet they were so disconnected from the activity, there just wasn't very much going on. But something else happened. A notice came from the Carlton Board of Education was going to do a school accommodation review, which could result in some closures of schools, some changes of school boundaries, etc., etc., etc. And as you know, there's nothing like the possibility of a school closure or boundary change to get parents involved. Now, the school, the school my son was going to, did have a parent school association, but they had never really seen their role as being much more than running hot dog days to raise money to buy books for the library. And they did not want to take any position on, on issues in the accommodation study at all. So a bunch of people came to me and said, you did this kind of thing in Ottawa. Will you be our spokesperson? And, and see, see if we can make sure that this doesn't harm our children's opportunities here. And so I agreed to do that, but still did not really become involved with the school until a couple of years later when a new group of parents was taking over the association and they came and asked me if I would, if I would be active. And I said, I'm happy to do it on one condition, and that is I will not do hot dog days. So they said, well, that's great, because we have another thing for you to do. Okay, we, we, we understand there's a new board-wide group called the Car Carlton Council of Parents School Associations. Would you be our representative to that? And I thought, okay, I can do that. And so off I went to the Carleton Council of Parents School Association, which was the Carleton Board's board-wide organization. It had some similarities to the structures they had in Ottawa, but also some significant differences. And the, um, the, the big difference was that the Carleton Council brought elementary and secondary parents together. And the other thing was that the board recognized the council and actually allowed it to appoint representatives with a voice to attend their committee meetings, which was something no other board in the province, as far as I know, was doing then, and something that we still do in the public board today here. Uh, and again, I don't believe that there is any other board in the province that allows parents to come and speak up directly it's part of the discussion in their meetings. It wasn't too long before that duct tape problem again. I became <laughs> president of the Carlton Council of Parents School Associations and I was president of the association for three years. Uh, got to visit more than half of the Carlton Board schools. Found them quite interesting, particularly because I had half of the Ottawa Board schools to compare them to got to know more of the board members, 
better, uh, was the person who was involved in the strategic planning of the day, was the person who uh, was involved in bringing together a lot of opinions from across the whole board around things like changes to the grade seven and eight curriculum, changes to the high school curriculum and so on. Uh, dealing with some very controversial issues at the time as well, whether or not, for example, a lot of our public health should be allowed to have uh, a, a weekly clinic in one of the high schools uh, where students could get information on sexuality and health. Uh, that was seen as a very, very, very bad thing in some parts of the jurisdiction uh, and uh, was, was a, a real challenge to try to find the middle path which satisfied the worries but also made sure that the education was available. And so by the time we hit 1991, I thought, okay, I will run for the school board in West Carlton. Uh, and ran that year against the incumbent chairman of the board who had been there for 12 years or 13 years. Um, I didn't quite know. So I went back to doing what I had been doing, uh, served as the representative, the parent representative on the Special Education Advisory Committee and chaired that for three years, and then ran successfully in 1994. So I was elected in 1994 to the Carlton Board of Education, coming in with the, 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 the luxury of having had a good number of years to watch trustees, to see some of the very best behaviors that trustees can be involved in, and also to see some of the very worst behaviors that trustees can be involved in. Uh, you could tell that not everybody was always looking at it on a system basis, but my background and training was such that I had to look at it as a system. You couldn't just do what this parent wanted and what that parent wanted and what this school community wanted or what this particular trustee wanted. All of the decisions are made by the 12 trustees of the board, the whole board which means that you have to make all of the decisions in that context of the whole board. And I think that's one of the things that the general public has not really understood particularly well about school boards, and that is that we are not there to do necessarily what you want. We are there to do the best we can to make sure that our children in our community are having the best opportunities for student achievement and well-being that we can provide that work within this community. And sometimes that means that you have competing interests. You cannot serve them all, but you have to figure out one way or another and come to agreement as to what is actually going to be the best path forward. The legislation around school boards was changed just a few years ago to reinforce that idea, to make sure that trustees are not there out there micromanaging the system, but rather our, our job is not to run the system. Our job is to have the vision for the system, to set the policies for the system, and to make sure the system is run well. We don't run the system. We have staff to do that but we have to make sure that our staff are following our general direction, that we have had that picture of where we need to go and to put together the pieces that will help us get there. When it comes to consulting with individual parents, yes, we do a lot of that, but again, our job is not to solve the problem. Our job is to make sure that the problem is solved which means we go to the superintendent. If the superintendent doesn't call the parent back, yes, I get very upset. If the parent is not happy with the ultimate decision, as long as it was a reasonable decision in accordance with our policies, I, I'm not going to go and say, we need to overturn our policy. 
But if I hear from a lot of parents that a policy was not the best policy in the world, then I will have a good look at that policy because maybe that policy of the board isn't working for our communities and maybe we should be looking at making some changes to it. So we take all of that together and try to fit it into that big framework. And I forget when I started, but what I'm gonna do is switch over now to the documents that you have in front of you. Because what we have done over the last few years uh, was to start to look more closely at how we were engaging in governing the school board. And we did two things, I brought you two things. We, we started, first of all, we did change our governance policy to give much more prominence to strategic planning. And we have developed uh, one strategic plan which is almost finished now this year. Uh, we're still waiting for you. We'll be getting reports this fall, I expect, on how well that finished. But last spring, uh, we developed a new strategic plan, which will be covering the years 2015 to 2019. And this plan, we did a new way. We, we'd always tried, go ahead. Uh, we'd always tried before to consult and we'd have meetings in various venues and, and we'd uh, ask people to come out. Uh, sometimes you got the same people who would go to the meeting in the East, West and South uh, and say the same things. And we'd never hear from an awful lot of people, but we'd hear from some people three and four times. This time around, we used a firm that did some electronic surveying around some key questions. We had more than 13,000 individuals respond to that. We invited every student, I think from grade seven up, we invited every member of our staff, we invited every, fa every family to respond to the questions. And a lot of them very graciously did provide us with their thoughts. We were able to break the data down and look at what we, was coming out of different school communities, out of different parts of the city. You could see that there were some different concerns if you looked at the downtown core versus if you looked at the east or if you looked at the west or if you looked at the rural area versus the older suburbs versus the newer suburbs. We could, we could start to track those kinds of things. But overall, there were a few themes that came through very strongly. And so having got all the data in hand and having had a chance to digest it, we sat down with our senior staff and thrashed it through, trying to figure out what were the five key topics. We really wanted to have three key topics. Uh, our consultants always tell us you should never have more than three big things in a strategic plan. We couldn't get it there because education is a complicated thing. But we did get it down to five, and if you look at the middle pages, you'll see that the focus for the next four years is four areas. Learning, obviously, because we know that student achievement is incredibly important to all of our communities. Equity, you will see at the top, because we also know that there are groups within our schools that are not doing as well. And part of the reason they're not doing as well is not, no fault of their own. But if we were able to differentiate how we provide support to them, we should be able to raise, raise their opportunities and their achievement levels. For example, our students who are in special education programs, our students who are uh, Aboriginal uh, in heritage, our uh, students who come from poor families, our students who don't speak English as their first language, you can see when you look at the provincial test data that there are gaps between those. And we want to make sure that we are doing our best to provide every, ch every child with that equal opportunity, which means that some children will need more support to have the same opportunities. We also want to be concerned about well-being 
that is now very much in the legislation, part of the school board's mandate. And that goes to some of the issues of mental health. We hear about teen suicides, we hear about bullying problems, we hear about a whole lot of things uh, that go to children not enjoying well-being. And we are required to do school climate surveys every two years. Uh, the data we've had from that so far shows that although a lot of our kids are quite happy and feel safe and comfortable at school, not all of them do. So what should we be doing to make sure that they can? Because it's very hard to learn if you don't feel safe. And it's also very hard to learn if you have a lot of other worries on your mind. So well-being is an important piece. We know that we can't do it just all by ourselves, which means that engagement is important. Research and education shows that students who are actively engaged in their learning do a lot better. They learn more. I mean, you to remember back to your school when you had that boring history class. How much of that do you actually remember? Whereas the really neat science teacher that did the good experiments, you probably remember a lot of that. Or the English teacher who really got you turned on to some good reading. Those kinds of things you remember, but you have to be engaged. And if you're not engaged, you're not going to learn. The other people we need to get involved more are our parents, the parents of our students, and our community members. How many of you have been in a school in the last year? For your children or, or as a volunteer? As a volunteer. As a volunteer. So you will see that there's a huge need for volunteer involvement in our schools. And there's a huge need for parents to be connecting with their kids' learning. And it doesn't have to be going to meetings. The kind of involvement that I had as a parent going to meetings isn't for everybody. For one thing, very few people have the time. But the other thing that I did as a, as a parent, I, we read aloud in our house. We never went on a car trip without playing counting games and watching things and spelling things and doing all of those kinds of, of involvement. We never had an evening when, even if you didn't have any homework, there wasn't some kind of learning activity going on. And every parent can do that with their children. You don't have to have a lot of time. It doesn't take a lot of time, but that involvement, even for very small times, has an impact and helps your children be engaged in learning. So we need to engage everybody, the kids, the parents, the community, in supporting how important that learning is. And the last piece that we came, we, we felt was important was stewardship. Because we're working with your tax dollars whether it's the part that gets collected locally uh, as part of the provincially set property tax, or whether it's the part that comes out of your income taxes and gets doled out to you from the provincial coffers in accordance with the funding formula. We need to look after those dollars properly. We can't afford to waste them. There's never enough money to do all of the things we'd like to do. And that means sometimes taking a very critical look at how we're doing what we're doing and seeing if there is a way we can do it that would be more cost effective, that would be better for our kids, even though it may not be the traditional way. But we need to think about how well we can serve our, our students with the funds that we have available and make sure that, that every last penny it is not just spent, but spent well. So when we take all of these things, the objective of all of this is to serve the exit outcomes, which is the other document I've given to you. This was developed under our old strategic plan, and that old strategic plan is in very small print on the back. But we heard from many parents and employers that the purpose of education is not just the reading, writing, and arithmetic part that employers are looking for people who are resilient, 
who have some global awareness, who know how to be team players and collaborate with other people. People are looking for workers who can be innovative, that you have a new idea, that you know that there's a goal at the end of the game and you're oriented towards reaching that goal. We, we hear a lot about critical thinking. We hear a lot about communications. What point is there if you have somebody who's working away on something here, but they don't ever talk to anybody else about it, so nobody else knows what they're doing. They can't put their ideas together. We need people who are academically diverse. It's not just the math and science that matter. Everything matters. The world is changing so fast, you just can't tell what is going to be the important piece of knowledge that is going to be absolutely crucial for your success 15 years from now. And remember, we have our kids for 14 years. So we have to think quite a few out. We also want our kids to be ethical decision makers. We don't want to see the kind of slippery decision making. They need to be thinking within that context of that global awareness that their decisions have impacts on other people and make sure that those impacts are not harmful. And the last thing, of course, in a world that is changing so rapidly is the digital fluency piece. Within the context of those exit outcomes, that is where we are coming from with this new strategic plan. And I'm going to stop there and ask you if you have any feedback for me, any suggestions for me that would help us in terms of how we move forward over the next four years to make this plan happen and to really see those improvements for our kids. Because as an adventurer, I think this will make a difference for a lot of children and I'd like you to help me do it. So thank you very much. Over to you. Well, I've been involved in several strategic plan activities. This one looks pretty thorough. It's, uh, it's actually very impressive from my uh, experience.